Welcome everyone. I'm impressed that you're here, being it's one of the last sessions of this conference, but you all should get gold stars for that. Uh, we have some compelling speakers. I'm actually excited to see this first presentation. Uh, very intrigued. The title, Visualization Tools for Infrastructure and Project Management. If you've learned one thing over the last two days, there's a lot of innovative things happening and we're all trying to figure them out. And uh, despite trying to figure it out, it's all happening regardless. So it's exciting times, in my opinion, uh, with the use of technology in our field and in general. Um, it's just as we continue to develop it, we got to remember who our end users are and tailoring that technology to them. Uh, I always like to bring up the example of my dad and uh, my dad was like the last person in my town to uh, give her the flip phone and get an iPhone. And uh, one day he called my cell phone and I answered it and he goes, he was at the doctor's and he asked me if I would be a reference for him at the doctor's. And I'm like, of course, I'll, I'll be your reference. And there's a pause and he goes, uh, so uh, what's your phone number? And I'm like, my phone number? You just called it. And he goes, I don't know. It just <laughs> chuck on my phone. So he sort of knows how to use the technology, but not really. So keep those kind of things in mind. So we have uh, two presenters to start off uh, uh, visualization and decision support. We have uh, Ryan Noyes and Chris Dubois. Ryan is the director of innovative product development team at VHB supporting the 3D design workflows, missions, GIS applications, and CAD operations. He says he has extensive skills, but we'll see. And Civil 3D, MicroStation, Inroads, Geopack, Navisworks, Infoworks, and all the other works, pretty impressive. And he served as a member of the annual Bentley Users Group Advisory Committee and as a board member of the Vermont Society of Engineers. Chris is a visualization specialist at VHB who makes Ryan look good, correct? Yes, yes, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. And he helps design all of VHB's uh, design workflows, extensive computer skills, <coughs> and everything that Ryan knows just better. And he combines his artistic background of work on roadway design and reconstruction projects. So welcome to Ryan and Chris. Thanks, everybody. Um, so. I will try to keep on point and on target for time so that Chris doesn't start throwing things at me. But um, taser, yeah, sorry. Uh, so again, we're here today to talk a little bit about using visualization as a tool in decision support and getting stakeholders engaged in understanding what a project is and what it means. Um, I think all of us by now at some point in one of the sessions we've attended have seen a graph similar to this graph on the right. Um, you know, the key for us is getting people to understand that visualization uh, is a tool to be used at the start of project delivery and not upon project completion, not when all the signed decisions have been made. Using visualization engages non-technical staff and non-technical project stakeholders into the project understanding earlier on and what it does is it makes changes in our design when we can afford to make changes in our design versus at the end of the design process. Um, if anything comes out of this, modeling is, is the key and communication is the key with making visualization part of our standard process. So as jobs have become more complex over the last 20 some odd years that I've been in the industry, um, we have seen a need to not only have they become more complex from a design standpoint, but also from an approval standpoint. So engaging in a way that we can communicate with everyone on a project, not just technical staff, has become the key. And we found visualization really helps transform that. Um, and visualization now is not one thing. It's not a rendering at the end. Uh, what it is is that it is understanding the key components of getting a project approved in showing that information in an easily consumable format. So for example, we'll take a project where traffic is our primary concern and not worry about modeling the 3D component 
of that and showing all of our buildings in detail component, but instead, how does traffic flow and pedestrian movement really improve as part of our project process? So visualization is not a one size fits all approach on a project delivery. Um, so some of the key technologies we're going to touch on today as we go through the four different projects we're highlighting is we're going to hit on some preliminary design modeling tools. There's a whole bunch of tools available to us now um, from SketchUp to InfraWorks to ConceptStation um, to more detailed modeling solutions as well to get into final design and construction that we're all used to from our experience within the industry. Uh, the other thing we're going to hit on is real-time rendering apps. It used to be the workflow around visualization was, oh, here's my model. I'm going to go send it out to my render farm and I'll talk to you in three to five days. Real-time rendering really allows us to make design changes and visualize those changes almost immediately. Um, that, that traditional so design software still plays a part in this workflow and um, who here hasn't heard uh, data is the new oil? You know, the, the beauty is, is that all of these visualization tools now are built to mine that oil, which is our design data, and present it in a way that's meaningful for our project stakeholders. Uh, and then finally, probably the most fun is the gaming platforms, which gaming platforms are, are really allowing us to, to make the experience of reviewing our designs um, a, a self-guided experience. So you can go to the parts of the project that are key to you and view that model um, from that spot. So, you know, those technologies are everybody's Unity, Real, you know, all of the, the standard kind of gaming engines are, are out there. Um, and you're finding now that the ability to leverage design data in those tools is pretty straightforward as far as the workflows go. So to start with, we'll get to the first project. Um, first project is a little project actually in Nash County, North Carolina. I think we've got some people from North Carolina presenting next. So this was, uh, the project concern was, okay, we're laying out a new road along an existing corridor where we're going from two lanes to four lanes. We're changing from some standard intersections to uh, some roundabouts. Not only that, we're also putting a couple roundabouts close together in what we call a peanut roundabout configuration. Right. Um, and we needed to communicate to the public what that change was going to look and feel like for the people that drove along that corridor every day. And uh, since this really wasn't about large vertical changes along the site, and because there's a monetary component to any time we do part of a project development, we threw out 3D from the, the aspect of the, the changes to the roadway slope lines because this wasn't a huge right-of-way concern along this project. What it was is that how is this going to be changing the way that I drive along this corridor in Nash County? So what we did is we focused on presenting those geometric changes um, in a 3D environment so that people could see it, but along a plane. So we, we built the context around for the buildings and the community college that's in the area and the important um, monuments and sites that people would want to see. But what we did is we flattened the roadway onto a single plane and built all those other objects up around it because it really wasn't a concern about oh my gosh, we're bringing in a thousand yards of fill at, at my driveway. How am I going to now go down that? Um, so technology around it was actually Geopack and corridor modeling apps. So we took the, the Geopack 2D line work for, that was doing their um, layout and intersection design and leveraged that. Traditionally, this is how we would have presented this at a public hearing. I played the part of some sort of an engineer for close on 25 years now and i find this horrible to look at um, you know we have a rainbow of colors here well what was under those rainbow of colors how does it feel as i'm going down this i can't tell this i got typical sections there which you then have to explain to people what are typical sections how do they work well it's a section of the road you're looking down it not really the best way to engage the public so the approach that we took with this was instead, again, taking that 2D geometry, moving it into um, LuminRT actually was the tool that we ended up doing these renderings out of and showing the geometric changes in the upper right. You can see 
We've got two very closely connected roundabouts with <coughs> a small bridge between them. In the lower right, you can see we've got that peanut roundabout, which peanut roundabout was confusing for people to understand. How am I going to get? <coughs> uh, there was actually a, a shipping location off just on the upper part of the screen from here. And how are we going to get large trucks in and out of the peanut? Um, and really allow people to understand what are those changes when we're going from a two lane road to a separated divided highway. So really allowed us to communicate clearly versus this to everyone, what that change was going to be. And was something that we could do early on in a cost effective manner to get public support for a project versus spending more time trying to explain to them what the design and design intent was. So one example of a simple approach to visualization to move a project through acceptance. And now I think Chris is going to go through some of our more complex projects. So one of the things we do believe in, and I'll get to the microphone in just a second, is these cost effective um, visuals. We do uh, a, a fair amount of them, most of our um, typicals are, uh, or are, most of our projects are three to five days on average. Um, this one took a little bit longer. This is um, Kelly Square in Worcester. It has constantly been ranked as one of the worst intersections in, in Massachusetts. Um, living in Massachusetts, I, I live about 50 miles from this intersection, and I hear about this intersection on a weekly basis, just through the through the news. Um, uh, there are a number of changes happening in Worcester, including a new uh, a new ballpark uh, coming up the road here. So it was important to start to look at some of the uh, some of the final design geometry and uh, making sure that we were better able to move vehicles and uh, pedestrians through this corridor, especially, like I said, as we we add the the ballpark in. Uh, so early in the design phase. Um, we we took the the design plans again. This is one of those where because we were working within the tight constraints, we didn't worry about the the elevation. It was fine. We just built everything on a on a flat plane. But we went through a number of de design uh, changes to uh, see how everything impacted the neighborhood, move the um, the bicyclists and the pedestrians. We ended up by going through some various phases uh, with them. And um, let's see. Well, actually, let me just kind of run you run you through. So, uh, sort of the first step was let's look at some of the lighting and, and signing plans. So uh, they we were we were provided all of those and able to incorporate them quickly and easily into our into our plans. Uh, they the the lights change a number of times, but we were able to just go in quickly replace those. Uh, those light models and produce new new images. Um, the landscaping on approaches. So as we got into the final de final phases of, of design, um, the landscape uh, approach became very important. And, and what was the pedestrian experience in this area going to to be like now? Uh, so we, we made sure to spend a bunch of time with our landscape architects to, to go through so that we could accurately uh, accurately depict this. And as well as, again, p pedestrian and bicycle access. Um, currently, the way the, the intersection's set up, um, uh, pedestrians were taking risks to, to cross the street. And we were looking to um, eliminate those risks as, as much as possible. Uh, public outreach for this project was was a huge, um, just a, a, a big deal. Um, there were a number of, of public meetings, and um, the city and MassDOT was uh, very happy with our public public outreach plan, um, and we were nominated and ultimately won the Jane Jacobs 2019 public outreach. Um, award for this project. We broke ground just last week and we expect it to be a two-year process. Um, all right, this isn't going to play. So what we provided, 
Dubbed one of the worst intersections in Massachusetts, Kelly Square in Worcester was badly in need of an overhaul to improve safety and mobility, enhance connectivity, and support economic growth for the city. BHB proposed a number of innovative solutions, including... Sorry. Let's restart this and pretend the last 15 seconds didn't exist. <laughs> Dubbed one of the worst intersections in Massachusetts, Kelly Square in Worcester was badly in need of an overhaul to improve safety and mobility, enhance connectivity, and support economic growth for the city. BHB proposed a number of innovative solutions, including a hybrid design known as a peanut roundabout the first of its kind implemented in Massachusetts. This new roundabout will accommodate the intersection's many roadway connections and slow down drivers, with the goal of substantially increasing safety. Studies have shown that roundabouts can achieve as high as a 90% reduction in fatal collisions. Throughout a robust public engagement process, MassDOT relied on BHB to introduce the public to this new roundabout design. Our visualizations help the public to see what the intersection would look like, how traffic would flow, and how safety could be improved. In fact, the project won the 2019 Jane Jacobs Award for its outstanding public process. Mm -hmm. To learn more about VHB's visualization team... Well, you can see Ryan if you want to learn more about VHB's <laughs> visualization team. So another project that we uh, that we worked on was the General Sullivan Bridge in Newington and Dover. So matter of fact, the, the the two bridges on the left, I was here for the sixth annual uh, or, or the sixth um, symposium, and we actually discussed how we went out and, and built that bridge. And um, but now the the pedestrian bridge uh, was facing some uh, facing some issues and, and needs to be replaced. So our goal here was to look at uh, up to 10 designs and uh, in, in technical and non-technical ways to um, figure out what the most cost-effective, best looking, and uh, most functional uh, bridge was going to be. We did, uh, we modeled six of the concepts. Um, we focused mainly on the, the, the bridge itself and we, we already happened to have the two uh, existing bridges um, to the left built in. Um, we, it, for this process, we used a combination of um, a SketchUp and MicroStation. Uh, the bridges on the left were constructed uh, inside of MicroStation. All the ground came from our from our MicroStation um, surveys, and then we we rendered out our our final images and videos inside of LuminRT. But what was interesting with, with this project is we were able to export out a, a live cube. And now let me see if I can show you the live cube. I'll remember to slide it over this time. Yeah, look at that. Fancy. Oh, I... Almost. All right, we're going to live like this. Uh, and, and so our live cube is a self-executable file that we can send to the client. We let them know before that, that we're sending them a file that's an executable and it's okay and it's safe given today's uh, security climate. Um, but this is essentially, this is our whole model, the way that we see it in, in LuminRT. And it allows the, the end user to, uh, to be able to, to, to fly through the model. Uh, we also have the ability to set up uh, different uh, key points for them to use. <laughs> Sorry, your, your fan is kicking on. It's loud. Um, and, and so we were able to use this file to go back and forth and select the final views that, that uh, New Hampshire Department of Transportation wanted to use at the public meeting. We then coordinated those views between the six models and produced a... Uh, produced a, a, a demo reel. Ultimately, this was the, the option that was, uh, was selected uh, based on its functionality design and, and cost. Um, with this, it was, it was nice to have at the public meeting 
because the the public could come over and ask for a view from a specific location and we were able to just go to that location and um, give them an idea what what the that final view was going to be like um, and the JMU land bridge JMU had a problem they were constructing a new convocation center and they had 160,000 cubic yards of dirt that they didn't know what to do with. Along with, uh, across the other side of Driver Drive here, they also had constructed a new residence hall. So now that there was a mobility issue, how do you get the students from their dorms over to the dining hall? And right now they would have had to go down a rather steep path cross a road and back up a steep path. Um, VHB in working with the university uh, came up with the plan of a, of a land bridge. Uh, now, when we, this is typically right what we'd see for a land bridge, but, or, or for any of our design plans, the, the two dimensional design plans, uh, but it really didn't give the, um, the feeling of what does the land bridge actually look like. So inside of InfoWorks, using our civil 3D model that was created for the project, we were able to uh, import that in, apply some textures. We were able to take the landscape plans done by the LA and uh, bring in the appropriate types of, of trees. We um, provided uh, 10 or 12 images and a final orbit uh, video that was shown to the architectural review board where they received um, uh, expedited, expedited funding and they've actually just completed this, this project. Um, I don't have final images, but next time I'll have them. Next time we all get together. Uh, but, you know, what we did here, th this was one of the... <laughs> We wanted to see what we could do with, um, with this model since it, it already existed. Uh, so we created a, a video game so that we could walk through, uh, somebody could walk through at their, at their own pace. Thank you, Five. So, uh, import test. Oh yeah, we don't need that. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I preloaded that one and I had preloaded it not in the window view. So give me just one moment. Jamie, um, video game. So we use this model in a, in a in a number of different ways, and one of them was we we created this this video game that. We, we sent to the, <laughs> to the client slide over um, and allowed them to, to be able to uh, run through their scene. There's, there's a lot of information in it, so it does take a moment to load. Mobile thing. Mobile. That one they brought in and set up. Um, we had to bring it to the stockholders meeting. Uh, 
uh, wow. the, you know, like the VHV stockholders meeting because I wanted to let people know there's a reason to need a paycheck. Um, and that, that was our stockholders spent the day kind of exploring a project that we had just kind of a signature project that we've been doing. Sure. And there are a number of different op options uh, in the geodome. This was a rigid frame dome, but they also have uh, inflatable versions. And uh, I'll throw a plug out there. We worked with um, Illuminati uh, from um, from Minnesota. Yes, wonderful group to to work with. But uh, again, we were able to, to to take to take all these various data sets out and. Uh, and just use them in, in different formats, whether it was VR or the Geodome, or just for stills and video. That's, yeah. That's what I got. Thank you. He finished two minutes early, so any questions? Well, so uh, you mentioned uh, this last project was uh, already We, we uh, the JMU project. We came in towards the end. They had already um, uh, done the. I, th I think it was sixty percent. Yes, they had Good. contracted us to do the design, so we had a full design completed at that point. But they were trying to accelerate funding, and the architectural review board was going. What is? Need to rush yeah. Bridge, um, and trying to explain the notes and more of a park, more of a space that we're building for the for the college community, it was really hard to understand. So we said, well, let's give you something a little bit more immersive. So. Yes. On your previous project, the bridge project, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned modeling all the different alternatives and using them in our team. Yes. How did you, how did you visualize all those alternatives? That was that was exactly what we did. So, Luminarty has a few um, technical issues that you have to think about beforehand. You can't necessarily export view locations and um, and in those shot locations uh, like you, like you can in in um, say SketchUp. So we had to set each of those first, and and then we we went through and built version one, made a duplicate of version one, called it version two, and re-imported. And then we did that for each each additional set. That's why it was important for us to uh, figure out initially what the client wanted for their for their views, so that we could set them all up so that they were all the same. So that way, you kept all your trees and your views and everything else. There allowed to change the Absolutely, we we built the, the trees. Uh, do we have trees? In, we didn't have trees in this one, but we we'll we'll build the trees uh, once. Um, the cars we build once and the people. Um, we end up by having to move the cars around if the alternatives are different. Um, but, but the trees, you, you want all the same so that when you do that fade from alternative one to alternative two, all your background stuff's not, not changing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.